my starting point was as a barrister. I, my area of practice was corporate law and employment law. So uh, accountability uh, within corporations was of great interest to me. Uh, in fact, what I was dealing with was when uh, accountability failed in the workplace very often, so dealing with whistleblowing cases, unfair dismissal. However, my main interest was about the environment, and very soon it, it occurred to me that, in fact, we were dealing with a lack of accountability for not just people, but also planet within a corporate context. And my understanding grew from that in recognising that existing law was not fit for purpose. Environmental legislation as it stands is very piecemeal and is very often put in after the event as, as a piece of what I call compromise legislation, which still continues to protect the vested interests of corporate activity but not the land and the community that is adversely impacted by that activity. A, it, it occurred to me that dealing with this on a national level was not sufficient, that that would take us too long, going country by country by country. Uh, and what we needed to do was use international legislation to create, if you will, an umbrella law that then would have to filter down into all national legislation. International law supersedes all national law, but also it was a recognition that it needed to be a crime, criminal law, not civil law, uh, so that it could be levied against individuals, so that we could impose duties and responsibilities against people, not what is known in, in, in the legal world as the artificial person. A corporation is known as an artificial person, and all you can do with an artificial person, because after all it's just a piece of paper, an article of association or a charter, is fine an artificial person. But to use the weight of criminal law where you can levy um, the threat of incarceration, of being put in prison for damaging and destructive activities on a mass scale uh, is very important because of course then it becomes a preemptive obligation. No CEO, no head of state or, or, or head of finance institution will want to go to prison for supporting criminal activity at an international level. How on earth are you going to define what is ecocide? Am I going to be put in prison for ripping out all the bushes in my back garden? No. No, um, this, this is about identifying ecocide of, uh, ecocide of a certain size. What we have already in international criminal law is a, a crime of damaging and destroying the environment over a certain size uh, and duration and impact. So within war crimes, we already have a definition of that and that gives a definition of creating damage and destruction to an area uh, the size of several hundred kilometres, uh, creating damage or destruction that has uh, a severity lasting more than a couple of months, and that it affect affects either human activity, natural resources or, or ecosystems. So it's about taking what's already there and transposing it from not just being a crime during war, but also being a crime during all time, ultimately a peace crime. So are you saying that this happens during war already? It, it does to a certain extent, but it's been enormously curtailed by Article 8 to b of the war crimes having been implemented. So after the Vietnam War, what we had was a, a, a recognition that the damage and destruction that was caused during that war must never happen again. And out of that came various pieces of legislation, one called the Environmental Modification Convention, which set in place what damage and destruction can or cannot be done on a mass scale. So that was through the use of chemical warfare, Agent Orange, White and, and Blue. That has now stopped. Of course, with every new generation, we have new ways of trying to <laughs> work around such activities. But it has halted the use of chemical warfare to a, a, a great extent. If that hadn't been put in place, we would have very different uh, war field, war arena happening at the moment, far more damaging and destructive. 
So what we're needing to do is to take that. We know it has been effective during times of war and transpose that into times during peace. So are you talking about corporate eco-destruction? Yes, I am. Because ultimately that's where the mass ecocide is happening. It, it, it isn't with intent, deliberate intent, the majority of the time. It is what uh, I call secondary consequence. So it's a crime of consequence. Uh, a corporation going in is ultimately looking at creating profit. That's their number one intent. D- damage and destruction that happens along the way if they're an extract, inst- extraction company, whether it be for fossil fuel or, or, or for deforestation, is, is secondary to the, to the equation. It happens as a result of them pursue, pursuing profit. I'm not against the pursuit of profit per se, just against profit that uh, arises as a result of damage and destruction to the planet and to communities, to people. I've heard that a lot of deforestation in the Amazon is done by small-scale operations. Mm. Just lots and lots of small-scale operations. Mm. How do you get at that? Mm. Well, in fact, the analysis by what's coming out, the TIB report, uh, contradicts that entirely and says, no, that's not the case. It is seen to be that, but what is happening in the background is that you have large corporate activity. It may be happening in pockets, but its overall control is by... Um, s- larger entities, singular entities. And really this is about turning off the tap upstream, not downstream. So it's about taking out those few top players that are then having the trickle-on effect. So you have a kind of subcontracting out effect that happens. It may seem as if it's happening on a small level, but when it's closely examined, in fact, the control is held by very few international corporations that are involved. They just have fingers and many pies, if, if it can be put like that. And are you sure that the machinations of such destruction can't run and hide faster than you can chase them? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Am I sure? Um, I'm convinced that we need to put in place the tools to stop this. We don't have international legislation to stop it at the moment. All we have is a system that levies fines. Fines do not impose duties and obligations. All it does is it allows companies to continue with their activities. It's very much a catch-me-if-you-can mentality. Incarceration is a very powerful disincentive. If you're heading up a company and you know that your head will be on the block and that you're likely to be inside a prison for many years as a result of your activities. It does shift one's perception as to what sort of activity you really want to actively be engaged in, especially if you're at the command and control end of such decision-making and at such a large scale. So yes, I am convinced that this this will uh, shift quite rapidly uh, innovation into quite a different direction. And could this even affect heads of state? Yes, it could. Uh, the beauty is with international crime is that it, 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 the superior responsibility principle is extended out of what is known as the responsibility principle, that is, that it, it is a mantle worn by all. You cannot sidestep your responsibilities. Each man and woman on this planet carries responsibility, and those who are, have a higher position of responsibility or superiority of rank carry a superior responsibility and duties and obligations. So if anything, rather than evading it, they come first in line in having to be addressed. Mm. But what's to stop corporations having a puppet CEO to take the fall if one comes? Well, that's interesting because ultimately, yes, you take out the puppet, but you're also going to be taking out that form of corporate activity. So even if where there's a will by directors to continue on that avenue, they themselves are looking at possible incarceration. It's not just the head, but you're looking at those who are all in the superior responsibility. But then corporations are also answerable to their shareholders. You're not going to have shareholders wanting to support criminal activity. So there is a trickle-down effect here. Banks, finance institutions are going to want to put money into damaging and destructive activity. So all the systems that prop up the activity start to crumble rapidly. Governments no longer want to put in place policies that then render them subject to criminal activity and therefore 
looking at uh, being levied with crimes uh, against peace in the International Criminal Court as well. It, 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 in, an, in essence, what it does is it really does close off the stream of activity. It creates that barrier, that wall. Whether or not you're a puppet, those who are ultimately pulling the strings are exposed for what they're doing and they no longer have the support systems in place to allow them to continue with that activity. Could you give an example? An example of ecocide? Yeah, of, of something that, if this law uh, came into effect, would be, would be caught. Yeah. Well, I think maybe we should use an example that's very much alive today, and that's the BP Gulf oil spill. Uh, at the moment, such activity is entirely lawful. Uh, where we have the international crime of ecocide in place, then you have an examination as to whether or not that sort of activity is uh, allowable. And, of course, where you have activi activity that puts ecosystems, not just humans, at risk of damage on and destruction at such a high level, that is clearly in excess of, of community advantage gained, then you're looking at the crime of ecocide. That sort of activity would be curtailed. Now, how would that work? In essence, what would happen here is that corporations would be given a transition period. So there would be an implementation of the crime itself. There would be a transition period very often, for instance, in EU legislation, when we have transition periods of implementing directives as anything between six months and two years. So say we have two years here, we have an emergency, we need to turn around very fast. The subsidies that are propping up activities such as um, deep sea extraction of oil would be pulled. Now, fossil fuels is subsidised to the tune of $350 billion per annum. So that would be pulled. Now, those companies, it's not about putting the companies out of business, but, of course, they will be shouting lar very loudly for new subsidies to reskill up. They are energy companies. This is about really moving towards the, the green, clean revolution and mobilising very, very fast. A lot of people will need to be reskilled and trained. And so it is about that rapid shift, that rapid mobilisation. It's inevitable that there will be decisions that will have to be made. You know, how much fossil fuel extraction will we continue with, which is the least damaging and destructive of, of its type? to facilitate us moving and mobilising forces into that new arena. Um, it, it's a question of, OK, do we continue with offshore drilling or do we restrict it to onshore drilling? Do we start using new processes that are less damaging? Unconventional oil extraction is called unconventional because it isn't about simply drilling down and it spurts out. It uses five times more energy for extracting it from somewhere like the Athabasca tar sands. But we know that we can use laser technology, for instance, to extract fossil fuel. Terribly expensive, but it's not nearly as damaging and destructive to the environment and local impact and immediacy to local communities. So suddenly what you'll have is innovation happening in a very different direction. Now, fossil fuel isn't going to stop overnight, without a doubt, but what we do do is close the door to that which is most damaging and destructive, and offshore drilling is clearly one of them. A lot of powerful people are going to be a bit worried about this. Who have you got on your side? <laughs> Who have I got on my side? Uh, well, certainly I have an awful lot of climate scientists that are very engaged in what I'm saying. They believe that there's nothing less required than international criminal legislation. It's very clear that under the existing climate negotiations that we are absolutely failing. It's not working. Uh, the, there is no form of accountability written into that system in any event. And as we know from the Copenhagen negotiations, it was ultimately a collapse. Uh, out of 197 countries that are signed up under uh, the, the United Nations and the UNFCCC process, only one country succeeded in, in reducing its emissions successfully below the level that was required, and that was Portugal. So all those other countries, there's no way of levying any form of exercise against them for having failed to meet their targets. Countries ultimately know that they can get away with that. So that's not helping us. We know that we need to put in another system. We've left it to a form of, in essence, self-regulation. The self-regulation has not worked. So there's that. Um, 
there's the I uh, the actual legal community itself is starting to really become quite excited about this. There's a recognition that we are going to have to create the new laws. Just as Raphael Lemkin came along in 19, the 1940s and, and recognised that we needed to give name and weight and law to the word genocide. We didn't have that word in existence at that time. Um, so that justice could be seen to be done. And that's very important, the concept of justice being seen to be done. It's starting off the healing process, putting that in place. Now, this is not about hanging big CEOs out to dry and having them all lined up in the equivalent of the Nuremberg War trials. This is about actually making them part of the solution. It's about closing that door so that we do have innovation in the other direction very, very fast. It's interesting you mentioned Portugal. I flew over Portugal about three years ago, and there were forests of wind turbines everywhere. I was amazed. Mm. You literally, the landscape was, uh, there, were, there were wind turbines everywhere. Mm. Why can't we be like that? Why aren't we like that? Well, of course we can be like that. Our biggest problem is that national legislation has been stalled uh, for a long time to allow the doors to open to all of this happening. Um, in the last government, our Labour government, held three consultations on renewable energy. Now, it's not rocket science. Um, and, of course, the renewable energy um, industry said, yes, we want this, yes, we need this, yes, we need subsidies, or you need to pull the subsidies that are propping up the damaging, destructive processes that are in place. But that, that exercise resulted in virtually nothing. We've just had limited feed-in tariffs being put in place for local generation, or wind microgeneration, such like. But we still have an awful lot of legislative um, spaghetti, so to say, that is tying everything up in knots. If we had an international crime of ecocide in place, you'd find that spaghetti being unravelled very, very fast. We do need to do that. But obviously, we're not moving fast enough for this at the moment. Um, and this is where something like an international umbrella and international crime can really come into its own, because existing legislation that doesn't accord with the spirit of the international law then has to be either amended or rejected. And it, it creates an impetus, it creates a force of pressure for um, certain aspects to be addressed very, very fast. We just ha don't have that exercise of pressure happening, that force of pressure coming from within our own countries at the moment. Mm. So how many countries have to agree to this idea to bring it into force? Well, this, is, this will require an amendment under the, the Rome Statute. I, to, to make an amendment under the Rome Statute, which has been done very recently, in fact, it's, it's currently at the moment it's being amended to set out what crimes of aggression are, that's the run-up to war being declared and that has been determined just this summer in June. Uh, that requires a two-thirds majority. So you're looking at roughly 150 votes. Now, it's one vote per country, so it doesn't matter whether or not you're the size of Kiribati or the Maldives, your vote is equally valid as it is Russia or, or America or China. Now, it's a mountain to climb, but I say it's a small mountain uh, in comparison to current climate negotiations which are built on consensus building. And that's not just all countries coming on board, but all negotiators. Now, we have between five and 500 negotiators per country, depending on your wealth and how much you can afford to pay for a negotiator. So that creates a, a, a disproportionate imbalance where America has 500 negotiators, Kiribati has five. And there, with consensus building, you have to have thousands of people agreeing on every single item of content, every paragraph, every line. But where it's a two-thirds majority, of course, then what you are doing is you're levying, you're exercising what the majority say they believe should be done. So if you don't have America, Russia or China coming on board, well, that's just three votes that don't count. And inevitably, those smaller countries and the majority of the Global South are more likely to support the recognition of the crime of ecocide because those are the ones that are subject to ecocide or are at, are at risk of it. Certainly very much at risk of un non ascertainable ecocide. Uh, that is the damage and destruction that isn't necessarily caused by corporate activity but is caused by what is known in law as the act of God. 
so tsunamis, uh, rising sea levels, tornadoes, such like. Those, those countries desperately need assistance. And by I- Im- implementing ecocide, then it's a recognition that we also have a duty in care, international duty of care, to assist under trusteeship principles those countries that will be most adversely affected. Hmm. Don't the superpowers have a veto? No, no, it is simply one, one vote per country under the Rome Statute. Now, in a more general sense, we're talking about uh, eco-destruction. Surely all eco-destruction ultimately is caused by people, and there are a lot of them about. Isn't it about time most of us stopped having babies for a while? Certainly, this is one species that has has um, grown exponentially in its own numbers and uh, needs to address that. I agree. We do have a problem here. We're 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 you know, we are part of the imbalance here. Nature has a way of rectifying her own imbalance, and we're already seeing that happening with massive um, instances of what um, Crispin Tickell calls benign catastrophes. Not that there's ne- necessarily anything benign in, in a tsunami happening. We need to address this. We need to take responsibility, without a doubt. And one way of taking responsibility is a recognition of how many of us are here on this planet. Uh, we do it with other species. For instance, talking to um, one of the state managers for Dartington, talking about the culling of deer so a controlling of numbers of deer in the estate so that there isn't too much damage or destruction done. Culling is a very polite way of saying killing, ultimately, but it's in a managed form. Now, I'm not advocating that we kill our own, but that we start taking responsibility, and part of that taking responsibility is making value-based decisions as to how many children we produce, Mm. without a doubt. Now, ultimately, there are two ways of looking at this. Either we impose it, like the Chinese did for a time impose one child per family rulings so you can do it in that um, mandatory fashion or it can be done in voluntary fashion and if we examine uh, population explosions what we see is that there are certain countries that have uh, very high rates of population uh, growth and it tends to be developing nations now of course it's not politically correct to talk about this that in fact one of the biggest problems we have with population expansion is coming from those nations that are are not what we call supposedly developed, the developed world. I question whether or not we are actually that developed because we are the ones that are creating a lot of the problems in terms of damage and destruction. But there is one example that I found most useful when examining this um, question and that was in China there's an area in China called the Loose Plateau, and the Loose Plateau is the size of England and Wales combined. It is 45,000 square kilometres. It's a province in the centre of China. It's also one of the most hostile terrains in China. It, it, it used to be the most fertile area of China. In fact, it, it's where China was given birth to, the birthing point of China. But now, after many thousands of years, instead of it being a beautiful green oasis, what it is is essentially desertified ground um, where peasants' uh, subsistence farming has existed for the last couple of hundred years and the only creature that seems to benefit is, is the goat. So goats are rife and um, because they are virtually the only animal that can live on this hostile terrain and those who live within the communities within the Lis Plateau live a very harsh existence, very, very poor existence of living off very little um, scrapings from a a vastly depleted landscape. So the Chinese government decided to go in there and turn this hostile terrain back into a green oasis. And they did that within eight years. That is truly remarkable in itself, given that it's the size of England and Wales, a terrain that would take you an hour to travel over if you were flying. So that's a massive project that was engaged upon. What happened there were um, certain principles were put in place, certain guiding principles, and it was determined that it was about restoring biodiversity. So this wasn't about monocropping, 
This wasn't about putting in place massive monocultural agricultural practices. This was actually about returning the land back into its fertile state. And it was done by zoning. The lower areas that could be used for agricultural purposes were zoned off agricultural zoning. And those that were more difficult to get to and that were higher were zoned off as ecological zoning. It was largely about taking two thirds of the land back to make it into ecological, biodiverse tracts of land. Of course, for those who were living there, this was hugely problematical for them because they needed the land to roam as far and as wide as they could and for their goats because there was so little that could be gotten off the land in the first place. So this took a lot of uh, doing to actually convince those whose land they were proposing to change that they come on board with this. And it was recognised that what was very important there was to give tenureship of the land back to the people. And this was about saying, OK, we want you to be part of the solution, but we're going to have to take out that which is creating the disruption. In this case, it was the goats. So we're going to take your goats off from having the freedom to completely roam. We're going to, in effect, do a culling exercise. We're not getting rid of them entirely, but we're curtailing them. We're going to have to fence them. We're going to have to keep them in lower lands and in specific areas while we return those higher territories back into biodiversity. And to do that, that needed to put in, that was about putting in root systems. So the root systems were absolutely crucial. In fact, this is about, you know, it's a project that was enormous in, in terms of scale, but it can be done in, in micro as well. So it's about putting back in the roots. What are the foundations? And those roots were really about planting grass, because once, once you have grass that grows and you let it grow, you don't cut it down, its roots are twice the length of what is shown up, up above the land. And that then creates a system that holds the sand in place so that when it rains heavily, it no longer washes completely off, and then when it dries, you no longer have massive sandstorms. But more importantly, with the root systems, then you can implant and place other items to grow, other forms of biodiversity. There was a certain amount of placing back native species, but then it was a matter of largely returning it for the ecosystem to create its own biodiversity. So turning it back to nature, so to say. But by doing this, most crucially, what happened was from the higher areas, when the heavy rains came, then the, the biodiversity itself that was created there, create, in creating its own ecosystems, was able to store the water within the plant systems, create its own rivers, create its own shade. That then provided water for the lower-lying areas where agriculture was being put in place. But it also meant that last year, when they had their largest ever drought in China, that the loose plateau was so fertile that the waters never stopped running in the rivers, their foodstuffs never stopped growing, and they could feed other provinces. Now, what is so interesting about this is that this biodiversity um, exercise has had a, an enormous knock-on effect in various ways, one of them being for the local population. One of the biggest problems they had in the area was um, very high birth rates because, of course, children weren't living very long, so there were very high death rates as well. And now birth rates have dropped off exponentially. Children are living longer, but less and less children are being given birth to, and that's because of the well-being of the people in the area. So suddenly there's a first generation going through education. Suddenly women are no longer needed to be up and out tending to their goats or reproducing because they so needed assistance with their goats. Suddenly the women are in a position to make valued choices and decisions. Now we see this in other places. We see it in Africa, we see it in other places in Asia, where once there is a, an increase in the well-being of life for the people that live in a given territory, women no longer are either forced or have lack of choice in determining, self-determining what they want to do in terms of giving birth. And that, that birth rate drops. It also happens later. It doesn't happen as an automatic part of a cycle once a woman ends up in, in a, uh, her cycle of being able to reproduce, starts reproducing, choices are made. 
So that is a very interesting thing where sometimes you have, um, and we see this in law, where laws are created that banish, ban one thing happening and it has a knock-on effect here. What was banned in law uh, was the use of goats. <laughs> that was, that was the, one of the crucial aspects. China went in and said, we're going to render legal that which is damaging and the knock-on impact it had elsewhere. And we see this quite often with legislation. For instance, um, one of the births um, of um, creating a whole new industry, coal industry here in the 18th century, wasn't about passing laws to do with coal, but it was in the enabling, the canal enabling acts. And what that did was it allowed us to shift coal for hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of miles, suddenly we could we could build canals and one single cart horse could drag up to 400 times more coal than a cart horse could pulling a carriage. Now that was massive, that created huge mobilisation. It also increased the well-being of populations up and down the country. So we're seeing sometimes when we have the turning off of a tap or the turning on of a tap somewhere. The enabling acts was the turning on of a tap here that then created something else over here. Um, the curtailing of goats in China was the turning off of a tap there, which created well-being over here, and then reduced um, increase in, in, in birth rates. So there are many ways of, of tackling one particular problem directly and indirectly. I, and, and I do believe we can, we can use, it's also it's a holistic approach, you know, looking at well-being of people and planet at the same time. If we tackle something in isolation, then we start to create problems and it creates undue pressure elsewhere. Let's say birth rates eventually do fall in developing countries mm. and future generations, although they may be born into cultures that don't consume very much, they want to consume. Mm. They want to consume as much as we do. Mm. Isn't that a problem for the future? Yes, this is, this is really about shifting um, our values. So this is really about shifting paradigms. Um, and of course, law can be a, a lever to do that. It can help trigger that. So, you know, one of, the, one of the mechanisms is an international crime of ecocide because once you start examining damage and destruction to ecosystems on a mass level, then you get a very rapid filtering down to a more localised level as well. Suddenly you have, you know, local communities sitting there saying, OK, well, if we make a decision here as a town council to get rid of that children's play area, to build that um, supermarket... Isn't that actually damaging a local ecosystem? Isn't that a mini form of ecocide? What is it actually that we need to do for the well-being of the community? And given that we are looking at very real-time problems of peak oil and such like, then it, it, to me it seems utter madness to put in place yet another supermarket that's importing goods and foodstuffs from all over the world when a community like Totnes could be turning around to their local estate like Dartington and saying, actually, shouldn't we be coming together and joining our forces? We need your help to make our local community work. I saw a map yesterday of the Dartington estate and Totnes village, and what was abundantly clear to me is that this estate, because of course it was the estate for that village that grew out of the estate in any event, will be greatly needed by that village to assist them in surviving through this transition period. And, and when peak oil does come, because it will come, we are going to have huge problems. The very reason we're looking at unconventional oil extraction is because we can't even do it conventionally anymore. It's getting more and more difficult to get hold of, and it will get to a point when it's just too expensive to do and or criminally unlawful that we will have to look to our more immediate surroundings to build and to forge those connections and create the, the ecosystems, the, the, the life birthing systems such as the Liz Plateau has done. Okay, surely the biggest crime of ecocide is the global one, the, the damage that's being done to the atmosphere which may result in sea level rises. Mm -hmm. Who's going to get the chop for that? <laughs> well, of course, if we look at the global one, the excess of greenhouse gases, that's very interesting because 
we need greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases isn't something that we have to get rid of. This whole talk of car being carbon neutral it, it, it is misplaced. Um, we can't get rid of carbon dioxide. In fact, if we did that, we wouldn't survive at all. It's about the balance. And at the moment, we have a severe imbalance. We have an excess of greenhouse gases. We have an excess of carbon dioxide. We know that. It's being monitored. And that we know is as a result of certain activities that are being generated by human activity. However, tackling it in terms of excess greenhouse gases is just dealing with the symptom. It's not dealing with the cause. And an example that I sometimes use is this uh, example of holding a baby. And if your baby is vomiting, um, what you do is you take responsibility. Your automatic uh, concern is to stop the baby vomiting. Well, in essence, we can compare the baby to the planet and the vomit as the excess of the greenhouse gases. And instead of, of stopping the vomiting and finding out what the cause for the vomit is, uh, what we're doing is we're trading the vomit. We're hiding it. We're putting it under the carpet and calling it carbon capture and storage. We're not actually looking at the source of the problem and saying, OK, what is it that we're inputting into this system that's creating this? So um, just as we would go to a doctor if we didn't know why the baby was vomiting and the, the doctor would say, OK, um, your baby is allergic to milk, for instance, we certainly wouldn't turn around and say, OK, we're going to phase out milk for my baby um, you know, 10% over the next 10 years. What you would do is you say, OK, we stop giving the baby milk and we find a substitute, a more benign substitute that's not going to cause the damage and the destruction. And likewise, we need to do the same. And this really is about stopping the corporate activity because it is the corporate activity that is creating the excess of greenhouse gases. You know, yes, we each and every single one of us has responsibilities, but ultimately, I do not want to have to drive a car that is being fed by fossil fuel, which is generating excess greenhouse gases. We do not have a system in place that adequately compensates me to go and use uh, a, 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 an electric car that is coming from clean electricity from, say, the Sahara Desert, that is not in place yet. Now, it can be put in place very, very fast, and there are moves towards that, but we're looking at far too long a time scale. This is really about, you know, the baby still being given milk and just reducing it slowly, slowly, slowly. By the time it's finally reduced, the baby will be dead. And likewise, same here. You know, targets for 2020 and 2050 is far too long-term span, and also, again, it's just reducing the symptom, not the cause turn off the cause, go upstream, turn off the tap, and then you have a rapid, rapid turnaround. It's, I mean, ultimately we are stuck in, in, in a kind of catch-22 because we already have an access in the atmosphere, but we have a duty, we have a responsibility not to keep on contributing to that. We then have to remediate and help restore that excess that's there. But that's also about creating enormous carbon sinks, and that's not about monocrop plantations, it's about creating what was discovered by the World Bank, the Luce Plateau and its green oasis in eight years. That's the most successful uh, carbon sink we have in the world. And that only cost half a billion dollars to do. That was a cheap exercise. And we can do that. And the knock-on effects it had for community as well as ecosystems is enormous. So we are needing to stop, to halt that which is damaging and destructive. And we need to move towards remediation and restoration very, very fast. Let's look at a nightmare scenario. Sea level rises, huge flows of refugees, millions of refugees mm. flowing from low-lying uh, areas. Yeah. How can the legal profession help us with problems of that kind? Yeah. Uh, well, um, with the international crime of ecocide, uh, it, it, how I see this is it's rather like the software that can be put into an already pre-existing hardware system to make the cogs turn. Under the United Nations Charter, we have already in place there a trusteeship system. It was one of the founding pillars of the United Nations. Uh, what was put in place was the Trusteeship Council. That council was closed in 1994 for want of a job. It was dealing with just colonised states, decolonised states, the spoils of the Second World War, and it was deemed in 1994 that it was no longer needed. Actually, that Trusteeship Council is needed more than ever. Those countries that are affected by what I call non-ascertainable ecocide, so those that are affected by the rising sea levels, the tsunamis, what have you, 
They're the ones that need the assistance of the Trusteeship Council. And this is about reimposing that duty of care, fiduciary, legal duty of care, so that we take responsibility for those who are most adversely affected by non-ascertainable ecocide. We have a duty to look after our, those other communities that will no longer be able to self-govern, are either in a position of being unwilling or unable, by dint of loss of land, loss of communities. We will have to accommodate that, no matter how difficult it is, and we need to get into that mindset, and we need to make provisions, and the Trusteeship Council is there. We can reinstate it, and it can be put back in place. It can happen very fast.